you very much for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit today about the federal aquaculture research uh, education extension effort that we have. Uh, part of my job at USDA is to make sure uh, that we have our research priorities set such that they actually benefit the industries that we serve. And so that means a lot of connecting with stakeholders, understanding the challenges that they have, and understanding the capacity that we have in our agency uh, to be able to address some of those uh, priorities with science-based um, methods. So with that, it's, it's important to connect with stakeholders. It's also important to connect with other folks uh, in the federal sector, and then we have a lot of interagency coordination. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be done, and there's no reason that we should be duplicative in our efforts. And so uh, a lot of opportunity to interact with our other colleagues. So I'm putting together this talk. Uh, I put together some thoughts that are part of a collective effort that we have. So there's a lot of uh, influence from our agency at ARS, but also from the other folks in the room that, that we work with, and I very much appreciate their uh, contributions. So I often, uh, when I'm talking about aquaculture and, and our investment, turn back to the National Aquaculture Policy that came from the 1980 Act that uh, has been referenced this morning, and in particular this last sentence, it is therefore in the national interest and in the national policy to encourage the development of aquaculture in the United States. And for me and for many of the folks that, that I work with, um, we are encouraging uh, aquaculture in the U.S. through research, through education, and through the extension programs uh, that have been set up in our respective agencies. So a lot of this has been discussed already today, our capacity for aquaculture in the U.S., uh, capacity for expanding aquaculture in the U.S. We have a great regulatory framework. Uh, we have capacity for innovation and technology development. And this is across many sectors and also including, I would highlight, agriculture. We're a major producer of fish feed ingredients. We have abundant aquatic uh, resources. We are an agriculture nation. We have the most uh, agriculture exports in the world. And so we really have a foundation that will serve us well to be able to have science-based expansion uh, here domestically. Uh, also point out low aquaculture production, high seafood consumption, about a $20 billion seafood trade deficit that we have. And as part of USDA and Health and Human Services look at the dietary guidelines and their recommendations, Americans only eat half of what the recommendations say at this point. So a lot of capacity, a lot of justification uh, for aquaculture here in the U.S. Being in the federal government, there's a lot of agencies that touch aquaculture. So I've listed them here. This is a snapshot that was taken uh, a few years back. Uh, everybody that does research involved with science, involved with policy, trade, or any kind of uh, aspect related to aquaculture. So for this reason, we have uh, what we refer to as a subcommittee on aquaculture. Uh, again, this was authorized by the National Aquaculture Act of 1980. Back then, we referred to it as a joint subcommittee on aquaculture. It's been referred to as the Interagency Working Group on Aquaculture, and now the subcommittee on aquaculture that sits under the Committee on Environment. Uh, the idea here is to prepare coordinated research and development strategies and recommendations uh, for accomplishing national goals. Uh, and then also serving as a federal interagency coordinating group uh, that can have agencies talking to each other here in our nation's capital. So uh, as Jeff mentioned this morning, aquaculture is agriculture and it's also complex. Uh, here I've highlighted uh, what we consider in ARS in terms of agricultural food production systems where you have to consider the genetics they're going to go into the system, uh, the environment where the system is located, the management practices that will be implemented, uh, post-harvest treatment of products, and also the social factors and the marketing and all the things that go into that. When you consider uh, the complexity of all these issues and the need that uh, we have science and technology development to support them, but also to support the policy around them and how we treat uh, the different factors that we have, for instance, uh, genetically modified organisms uh, have uh, seen some need for regulation uh, in agriculture and animals, both in and plants. Uh, the environmental systems, management systems, biosecurity, fish health management, um, both in, within a company and in an industry. All these things are important and require an investment in science and technology. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the rationale for federal aquaculture research. As I mentioned, aquaculture is complex. We have many species I've seen where uh, it's upwards of 300, some species that are cultured here in the U.S. Um, as Craig pointed out, there's maybe 30 or so uh, that are the main species that, that we're producing. You have many production systems. You have the ponds, the raceways, the circulating aquaculture systems, and so on. But I think the most important rationale for this is that we have many small businesses. I think it's been estimated that we have around 5,000 
aquaculture companies in this country. And most of those are small uh, operations that lack their own capacity for research and development. So this is where the federal government can step in and support. Uh, supporting economic development in rural coastal communities we've heard about. Informing policy decisions is something that's inherently governmental. So it's important that we have the capacity to do that. I see that the federal government is really uh, has a role as convenient industry. So these are folks that are sometimes competing, sometimes working together, but it's important that we serve that role, uh, trying to look out for uh, various industries on behalf of the nation. And then I think it's incredibly uh, important that we support extension and ed education. So I tend to think about things in the research uh, uh, realm, but the extension is important. We have to get these technologies on farm, get them implemented, and the education is important, especially when it comes to developing our workforce. So uh, one of the things that I've been asked to do is to lead the development of a federal research support, uh, federal research strategic plan for aquaculture. And so the title of it, Federal Research Supporting Sustainable and Responsible Aquaculture in the U.S. There's a previous version of this plan that will sunset this year, and so we're looking forward to the next five years. And this is a draft, so I'm gonna tell you kind of a, where we're at at this point in time. But the vision that we laid out was a globally competitive, science and technology-driven sector that meets increasing demands for aquatic products that are affordable and meet high standards for safety, quality, and environmental stewardship, while providing new opportunities for profitability and economic growth. And so uh, I think we have an incredibly complex task, and this is something that we're trying to capture uh, in the draft of 30, 30 pages to outline what we see are the priorities. So, back. so uh, in this plan, there were some of the things that, uh, that we wanted to consider in, in developing, communicating federal priorities for research, science, and technology development. Uh, we wanted to lay out a framework for interagency coordination. And when it comes to aquaculture, you know, in USDA, we tend to be uh, food production uh, driven, um, but we wanted this plan to be inclusive. We wanted it to include food production, the aquaria trade, uh, recreational, commercial, fisheries, uh, the ecosystem services has been mentioned here today, and rebuilding stocks that threaten or endangered species. So since the last plan was developed and released, there have been some major advancements that we've had, and we thought it would be important to comment on these, and some of these have been discussed already. We mentioned rural and coastal communities and economic development. Uh, human health, the benefits of seafood and human health is something that we have been, we feel has been understated uh, in the past. Modernizing agriculture, we're seeing tremendous gains in, in the ability to farm all species. It's not just the gains that we're making in aquaculture, but in livestock production, uh, in crops we have, uh, precision agriculture technologies uh, that, are, that are being developed. Aquaculture needs to be a part of that. Uh, seaweed production has been mentioned, aquaponics, the ability to combine production systems between plants and animals, uh, the development of recirculating aquaculture systems that are coming online, seeing uh, large capital investments to, to develop and use this technology here in the U.S. And then a lot of excitement about the opportunities that we have for offshore aquaculture. So uh, quickly, we have three goals that we are outlining in this plan, and I wanted to share those and, and some of the major uh, objectives that we have. The first, provide rural America and coastal communities with new economic opportunities. And so here, in the first bullet, we were thinking about communicating about aquaculture. It's got, in some uh, communities, kind of a bad connotation. And so we wanted to uh, ask the question, how do we change that? How do we provide good information uh, to the public that they can understand the economic and environmental benefits of aquaculture. Second, conduct socioeconomic research to remove constraints to aquaculture and identify market opportunities for U.S. farm seafood. What should we be growing? What are the opportunities? We have a large investment in catfish and we should maintain that, but what are the other species out there that have great potential that we should invest in as well? Uh, educate and train a, a skilled aquaculture workforce. Even in ARS, when we go to hire scientists to, to find one that has an aquaculture background to come in and work on our projects, and sometimes be difficult. And so we're bringing in people from outside aquaculture and we're training them to work in this area. It's critically important that uh, we're able to train people to work in this field. And then finally, enable science-based expansion of aquaculture, and this is kind of what we refer to sometimes as the tools for rules. What are the information that's needed to develop policy uh, around aquaculture and the ability to expand here in the US? Improve aquaculture production technologies and management tools. So this is where we typically work, this is uh, in USDA, uh, providing farmers with access to improved genetics for aquaculture species without impacting resident populations. We were just talking about this a minute ago. 
where uh, breeding and selection and genome enabled activities uh, fall under this, but also uh, other species that limit the reproductive capability of farm fish so that if they did escape, they would not have an impact <coughs> on resident populations. Safe and effective tools and technologies to enhance and commercialize production of promising species. As I mentioned, there's many species out there uh, that are native that we could be farming. What is it going to take to get them to market where um, that's currently being supplied with fisheries? Next, to find and meet the nutrient requirements of cultured species, and I would even add, in every stage of their life cycle. So when they, when they are young, when they're um, first reared, all the way through their development to broodstock, how, uh, what is their nutrient, what are their nutrient requirements, and what is the best way to meet those in an economically sustainable way? And then finally, improve engineering systems for aquaculture production. And we've seen tremendous uh, progress in this area, both with recirculation systems and the split pond systems that we have with catfish, and other systems as well. So third goal, essentially enhance implementation of One Health approaches for aquaculture. Uh, here we were thinking primarily in, in two ways. One, develop safe and effective biologics and pharmaceuticals to protect animal, human, and environmental health and well-being. And then the second, promote and demonstrate the safety and healthfulness of domestic farm-raised seafood products. And so there's kind of an animal health uh, component to this and, and the food safety that we think is critically important and looking at a One Health approach, uh, as I've laid out here, the interaction of host, pathogen, and environment to reduce on farm uh, losses to disease. So uh, I thought it would be important to talk a little bit about federal research implementation. We basically have two strategies for this. Uh, one is our intramural system of federal labs across the, all the agencies that uh, have the capacity to do long-term research. Uh, we think it's important that they are stable uh, focal points uh, for activities that require a long-term investment. And some of these might include uh, having tests or demonstration sites, hatcheries, feed mills, uh, pilot scale <coughs> throwout opportunities, um, multi-generational genetics and breeding populations and disease diagnostics as, as we have in many state and federal labs. We think it's important that uh, these labs be responsive to federal goals and regulatory needs, and so uh, something that, as I mentioned before, we find to be inherently governmental. And then having risk factors uh, that we're able to take on that are a little bit higher than what the industry can do for itself. It, it's something that uh, makes mostly small businesses. Uh, it's something that the federal government should support uh, in terms of taking on risk. Uh, in extramural support, we're talking about support for universities, the private sector, and even sometimes other federal agencies. These are shorter term projects, uh, typically one to four years, and they're going to range, uh, have a wide diversity of topics that they'll cover, new species, um, the kind of projects that don't take a long term investment, but may lead to a long term investment, depending on their outcomes. Uh, they typically have strong education and outreach components, and again, the risk factors can be elevated compared to intramural. Uh, uh, supported research as well. I think one of the most important things that I've seen is that when we have the ability to integrate the intramural and the extramural programs, we come out with uh, value-added products that are, are critically important for so, uh, supporting our industries. And so I would say that the integration of these two uh, capacities is extremely important. I have to mention uh, opportunities for public and private partnerships. Uh, I think that our federal research should be stakeholder-driven in terms of engaging stakeholders to help set the priorities for what we work on, what we use our research capacity for, determining the value of uh, expected outcomes. If our research is successful, will it matter? Uh, as opposed to the value of research products. So how well did we do? Is this a successful program? And is this program having an impact on your industry as, as we would expect? We need uh, these partnerships to, uh, for technology development so that we can take things from a laboratory scale to a um, commercial scale. Uh, with capacity that we would not have. <coughs> um, transfer and commercialized technologies is, is related to that. And then also in terms of, of workforce development, we need to make sure that we are supporting um, the education and training of employees who are going to go on to be a part of the aquaculture workforce. So uh, one of my roles and the roles of the, of the subcommittee that uh, I have the uh, opportunity to participate on is strategic planning. And I pointed out to some of the documents that have come out here in the last several years uh, that are influencing the way uh, we're doing research. Uh, the first aquaculture genetics, genomics and breeding in the United States. Uh, we had a U.S. country report on aquatic genetic resources many of you helped with. We kind of took an inventory of what we're producing in the U.S. Uh, and how we're producing it. 
we had a marine fish aquaculture scoping workshop uh, in 2017 and a follow-on workshop in 2019 where we looked at uh, if we're going to have offshore aquaculture or marine aquaculture here in the U.S., what are the next set of finfish species that, that we would want to develop? And so uh, we brought together folks from industry, academia, and government uh, to be able to, to work on that list. Uh, genetic improvement in the United States is a, a work that's in progress, but making sure we all uh, have kind of inventory of the uh, genetic technologies that are available, both for selective breeding and controlling the genetics of farm populations. Uh, genome to phenome, I'll talk about in a minute. And then also the, the last one is the National Strategic Plan for Federal Aquaculture Research that we'll be updating. So I think one of the most important documents that has come out recently uh, is the science breakthroughs to advance food and uh, in agricultural research by 2030. Uh, of the chapters in, in this volume, only one of them is dedicated to animal research, and uh, only a portion of that is to, dedicated to aquaculture. And so what they highlight, and I'll read the last sentence here, the urgent progress needed today to address the most challenging problems requires leverage and capabilities across the scientific and technological enterprise in a convergent research approach. What they're saying is we used to do science uh, in kind of silos where we had geneticists over there, we had the engineers over there, we had nutrition people somewhere else, and they didn't really talk to each other. And that has to come to an end because this is one production system that we have and our efforts should be concerted with one another. So they call for a two-fold increase in animal protein. And they list the two ways that this would happen, a tenfold increase in the rate of genetic improvement and the development of precision livestock production systems. Had I been an author, I might say that well, we can expand aquaculture and we're just using a bigger footprint to produce animal protein. Uh, that would be kind of the third bullet item. But if we look at our best technologies that, that we've developed to increase uh, the rate of genetic improvement, our best case scenario gave us a twofold improvement. So we really are going to have to use all of the technologies at our disposal to be able to increase the amount of protein that we're going to need for our future global population. So with that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this document, so from animal genomes to phenomes, how do we get from genetics uh, to the phenotype and, and the things that actually matter on the farm. Uh, there was a previous version of this uh, that came out and kind of laid out some of the things that needed to be accomplished in, in the previous decade. They used three themes, science to practice, discovery science, and infrastructure. And I've got a puzzle uh, diagram here to kind of show how we see these things fitting together. And so in doing the revision, uh, there were initially 14 species that were targeted. We opened this up because we felt like this couldn't be inclusive of all the aquaculture species that we work on. And that so much has changed about the way we do genetics and genomics research these days uh, that there were just more opportunities and a much bigger community uh, working in this area. And so if you look at the priorities uh, that were highlighted, this, this is a publication that has uh, over 100 contributors. Um, that we're looking at everything in science of practice is pretty much how do we uh, breed these animals and how do we manage them on the farm for optimizing production. Uh, discovery science is a lot of the basic information that we need to be able to do that. And then the infrastructure, everything from the genome sequences, the education for the workforce, biotechnology, and a lot of populations that we have access to uh, for agriculture production. So I think one of the best uh, cases that we outlined in that publication was the U.S. dairy industry where we've seen traumatic gains over the last de decade and where we started using genomics in breeding programs, you can see we've got uh, increasingly uh, higher rates of gain. Uh, there was an industry that was started right here. We're showing uh, where animals reside that were genotyped. And so getting a DNA fingerprint from an animal was something that was kind of unheard of when we got into this process. And 10 years later, we've got an entire private sector industry that has started around offering genotyping services to farmers and the livestock industry. And so what this has done, uh, there's a $100 million research investment over 10 years, and this is by USDA. Uh, they saw gains of $50 per cow, 9 million cows. You look at the return on investment, and it ends up being around 40 to 1. So we consider that this is one of the best scenario uh, outcomes from this kind of research, but just something uh, that we can use in aquaculture as a goal. This is an industry that when they started had already gone hundreds of years with selection. And so uh, in this example, we're just tweaking an industry, whereas in aquaculture, we have opportunities to create industries. And so a lot of opportunity here. So I couldn't uh, move on without talking about this publication uh, when we're singing the praises of, of federal aquaculture-supported research. 
This is, uh, came from Dave Love with the John Hopkins School of Public Health, an analysis of $1 billion of aquaculture grants by the U.S. federal government from 1990 to 2015. So to, to hit the highlights, there were about 3,000 grants they looked at across the various agencies, but it added up to all, a little over a billion dollars worth of funding. And, and his analysis came out with a 37-fold return on investment. So uh, this is something that all of the federally supported research across the nation can be very proud of. So with that, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to work with a fine bunch of people here in the federal sector that have contributed to uh, the scientific planning that's going on and the interagency coordination. Uh, as one of my colleagues here likes to say, we're from the government and we're here to help. And so uh, that's kind of the mantra that we have. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.